Good afternoon, Liberty Hall friends. My name is Steve Smith. I'm the team leader here at Liberty Hall, and it's a joy to welcome you all to the first annual Joseph Smith III Peace Lecture. I'm speaking to you from the office on the second floor of Liberty Hall. We greatly appreciate your joining us this afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed Daniel Harmon's rendition of the beloved hymn by Joseph Smith III, Tenderly, Tenderly. Thank you, Daniel. Our co-hosts this afternoon are Barbara Walden and Wendy Eaton from the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation and Glenn Johnson, Lamoni Heartland Mission Center President. Our afternoon, our uh, invocation this afternoon will be given by Glenn. Glenn. Thank you, Steve. Will you pray with me? God of history and author of peace, we come before you and gather this day with grateful hearts that we can take this time to reflect on the shared heritage that we have together as members and friends of Community of Christ. We also know, O oh God, that this history is one that helps us to ground ourselves in the principles which we hold dear and to ground ourselves in the sense of calling that we have towards your kingdom on earth, Zion. And so we would pray that as we share this day, our minds might be opened, our hearts clear, and we are able to appreciate that which uh, has been prepared, that uh, each one might be touched, and that we might grow and learn continually in your presence. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. As many of you know, Liberty Hall Historic Site is a completely volunteer staffed site. We have no paid employees, but we do have expenses. Currently, Liberty Hall is closed, as are all of the church's historic sites due to the COVID pandemic, but our expenses continue. Here at Liberty Hall, we are also raising funds for the renovation and development of the Spurrier Schoolhouse where some of Joseph III's children attended school along with others. For those wanting to make an online donation, Wendy has dropped the donations link in the chat box, or you can mail your donations directly to the Historic Sites Foundation or to Liberty Hall. Wendy has posted those addresses in the chat box as well. And now, to Jim, Jim Doty Jr. As we've talked about this, Jim says he thinks of himself as more of a storyteller than a lecturer. He provided us with this delightful introductory bio. Jim's earliest memory, he says, is lying on a blanket between his parents, looking up at the beautiful starry night sky from a rural area in Southern Colorado. As a small boy growing up in Colorado, Jim wanted to be a forest ranger and wander the mountains of Colorado. Then he changed his mind and decided he wanted to be a nature photographer. Next, because of some wonderful traveling ministers that came to his congregation, he decided he might want to be a traveling minister for his church. By the time he graduated from high school, he decided he wanted to be a high school band director. Jim says he lived out those goals, but in reverse order. After graduating from the University of Nebraska, he was a school band director for 11 years and church choir director for 15 years. After two years as president, I'm sorry, after two years of persistent prodding from Apostle Lloyd Hirschman, Jim became a traveling minister for the community of Christ. After retiring as a traveling minister, he taught photography at Ohio State University. A lifelong participant and member of the community of Christ, Jim has served as a pastor, 
district president, mission center president, and president of 70. Jim's undergraduate degree is in music education with, as he says, side doses of English literature and history. His first graduate degree was in music with side doses of history and psychology. He spent one year in seminary studying Bible and Christian theology. His second graduate degree is in Christian theology and the religions of the East. Jim met his wife, Melissa, while at the University of Nebraska. They have two sons, one daughter, two daughters-in-law, and four grandsons. Jim says they are the light of his life. Jim's great passions are spending time with family and friends, sharing the good news of the gospel, music, and photography. Accompanied by camera or telescope, he still spends hours looking up at the night sky. Thank you, Jim, for being willing to share with us this afternoon. We're looking forward to your telling us about your friend, Joseph Smith III. Jim has been having internet issues at his house, uh, but Jim, are you still with us? I am, I hope. <laughs> So can you hear me now? Sounds we can like hear you, Jim. We can. <laughs> are, you, are you ready to share with us? Sure. Are there uh, any preliminary I, I, thoughts you wanted to make? Yeah. I've been asked to tell you a little bit about myself and the, the tape recorded talk you're going to see in just a couple of minutes. Uh, this is mostly for the benefit of people who don't know me well. I'm coming live to you from my phone because my desktop computer does not have a microphone or a camera. So I'm watching here and talking this way. A lot of what you might want to know about me would be told if you looked at this collection of pictures behind me on my right. That's a selection of my favorite photos going way back several decades, extending up to this year. They're all in chronological order. They include photos of family and friends, very special church services, wildlife, nature, astronomy, and some other events. At the end of the day, when everybody's gone to bed and the house is quiet, I like to sit here for a few minutes, watch the pictures go by, and give thanks for the things that are the most precious in my life. Which brings me to the presentation you're about to see. I have loved stories since I was a child. In 1960, the church sent Almer Sheehy to Colorado. He did a series of sermons in the Pueblo congregation and he stayed in my parents' home. And I remember laying awake far into the night, listening to Almer and my parents in the living room share stories from their own lives and special stories for the restoration. 23 years later, I was in a pastor's home in Eastern Oklahoma, I was a brand new traveling minister myself. And far into the night, we were sharing stories from our lives and treasured stories of the restoration. So I came by it naturally. I have been a storyteller as far back as I can remember. Because a couple of weeks ago, our internet started going out unexpectedly, sometimes for an hour or two, sometimes for nine hours or more, I decided we better take this presentation so if there's no internet today, you could at least see what I wanted to say. I discovered in the process of taping that I could do some creative things that I couldn't do with a live presentation. I should uh, give you one warning on the opening segment and the first location. As I was taping the introduction to my talk on Joseph III, tens of thousands of cicadas decided that they wanted to join in on this presentation. And being the nice person that I am, I didn't have the heart to tell them to be quiet. It's a beautiful summer evening here at Liberty Hall. This was the home of Joseph Smith III from 1881 to 1905. Two years ago, I shared a series of stories from his life mostly personal stories, more about him as a father and a husband and his own struggles and questions. 
than they were about his prophetic leadership as president of the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Ideally, we'd be sitting around talking about Joseph in a circle, but since that's not practical with us spread all across the country, I'm doing this by video. Joseph's been my friend for a long time, and I bet you wonder how we became friends. Well, I'm glad you asked that. It's a cloudy and uh, drizzly day here at the University of Nebraska. We're here because this is where I developed my friendship with Joseph Smith III. Kind of an unusual story. I was dating and I had fallen in love and I was trying to decide should I ask this woman to marry me. It wasn't a matter of whether or not I loved her, I did. It wasn't a matter of whether or not she was a high quality person she was. My question was simple. Would we have the kind of relationship that would be mutually supportive over decades of married life? And I knew people who fell deeply in love but were remarkably unsuited to live, to eat, live with each other. So I decided to find some experts. But I didn't go to the local bookstore to read uh, in the self-help aisle and relations to all that. I decided I wanted to read what did leaders in my faith community do when they were deciding if they would ask somebody to marry them. I only found two people who discussed their love life in their books, Joseph Smith III and his nephew Albert A. Smith. So I read their biographies to see whether or not the person I was in love with is the person I should spend my life with. Well, the question is, did it work? I'll answer that question later. What happened was, as I was reading Joseph Smith III's autobiography, I learned what a remarkable person he was, what a candid person he was, how honest he was about his life, including the relationship with his three successive wives and his children, and it was a remarkable book. And that's where my friendship began. Now, reading his book about his love life and where Albert A. Smith talked about his love life, did it help me make my decision? Well, yes and no. Uh, neither book told me, yes, the person you are in love with is a good person to live with the rest of your life. But what those books did tell me was, it's really important who you decide to marry. The quality of the person is important, the relationship is important, and the decision is really important. So, several months after I read those two books, not too far from here, across campus where there were some large columns, they were called the kissing columns, still are, but unfortunately they're under in storage now because of construction project that's going on so I picked these columns. In fact if I were Samson I think I'd do my best to see if I could move these things. But one beautiful March evening with snow drifting down out of the sky I took the woman I was in love with to the kissing columns and I gave her a pearl lavalier necklace. Back in the 60s that was a promise of a ring to come. Several months later, I gave her an engagement ring, and a year later, we were married. And just not too long ago, we celebrated our 51st anniversary. So do Joseph and Elbert get credit for that? Well, a little bit. I learned a really valuable lesson from my ancient history professor here at the University of Nebraska. Every one of us sees history through a lens. And whether we realize it or not, that lens changes how we view history. His own life is an example of that. When I was doing undergraduate work in his first class, it was quite a challenge, both for me and for the other Christians in the class. Because when ancient history butted up against the Bible, my professor shredded the stories in the Bible. Moses went up in flames, Elijah went up in flames, and to the pain of all the Christians in class who would argue with him, lecture after lecture, Jesus went up in flames too. So after class, I would follow him to his office and we would go round and round and round in friendly arguments about history and the Bible. In one of those discussions, he shared with me his story. He grew up a Christian. He wanted to be a minister. He wanted to preach the gospel and touch people's lives. So after he got out of college, he went to seminary. In seminary, he lost his faith. And I mean, he lost all of it. So he dropped out of seminary. He knew he could not, in good conscience, stand in a pulpit and say good things even about Jesus, about whom he had many suspicions. So instead, 
He went to graduate school, got his PhD in ancient history. I came back to the university to get my master's degree in music, and I again signed up for one of his classes. We again went round and round and round after his classes in his office discussing details of history. I was a little more ready this time. I had read a lot of books and done a lot of study. I didn't win any battles, but I did score a few points, and we had a good time together. I got my master's degree. I came back several years later to visit with him again. I stopped at the university bookstore on the south side of campus. I looked at the books he was required, and I could not believe what I was seeing. So when I went to his office, I said, what's with the books you're requiring? They are really different from the books I had to read. And he said to me, I've had a life-changing experience. His wife was terminally ill. The doctor said there was no hope of recovery. Against his wishes and behind his back, a group of Christians got together and prayed for his wife, and she was instantly and miraculously healed. And he looked at me and said something that has stuck with me to this day. Once you accept the possibility of a miracle, it changes everything. Now, if he was standing right here next to me, he would say, you are foolish and gullible if you believe every miracle story you hear, including every miracle in the Bible. The fact that he believed in miracles and believed some of the miracles in the Bible didn't mean he believed all the miracles in the Bible. And that's an incredibly valuable lesson. Because that not only applies to the stories in the Bible, that applies to the stories we hear today, including the stories of the Restoration because we are free to choose which ones make sense to us and which ones don't. It's a nice breezy day here in Lamoni, Iowa, and I'm sitting on a pew that's rather special to me. In fact, I've had a special request to tell you the story behind this pew. Back in the 70s, I got a phone call from an elderly couple. They were downsizing and moving to a retirement community, and they said, we have something we think you might like. We know you love the restoration. We have a pew that was in the old Gallons Grove, Iowa church. And my wheels started spinning. They told me this pew dated back to the days when Joseph III would go and visit and preach in Gallons Grove. And I could see people sitting on this pew as Joseph Smith III stood behind the pulpit and preached the dedicatory sermon for the Gallons Grove congregation when they rebuilt the church after the original log church burned down. So this has been in our family for a long time now, dates back to 140 years ago, and it says something about my love of Joseph Smith III. I want to talk to, him, uh, to you about him today a little bit in terms of his credibility. There are people that we put high credibility in, people we don't trust at all. Uh, all mature adults know that there are people who know what they're talking about and they tell the truth and they are highly credible. And then there are people who don't know what they're talking about, but they think they do. And so, although they're well-meaning, they are sharing things that aren't true. So we put them kind of down the credibility scale. And then, of course, there are all the liars and charlatans who are deliberately sharing stories that are not true. I won't mention any names, but a number of years ago I met a, met a minister who told me he deliberately made up stories for his sermons that were not true. And I said, you shouldn't do that. Credibility is everything. He says, no, it's winning people to Jesus that matters. So it doesn't matter if the stories I tell are true or not, as long as I'm winning people to Jesus. Well, that just, that just makes me crazy, because what happens if somebody finds out those stories were made up? So the credibility of, the, of our stories really matter a great deal. In terms of spiritual gifts, I place Joseph Smith III really high on my credibility scale. When he says four Native Americans walked into a prayer service and they asked permission to share in their own language, and Joseph Smith said, I understood everything they said in English, I believe that. There's other reasons to believe it too. When they were done, Joseph Smith III got up and said in English what they had said in their native language. 
and and Joseph said they were incredibly excited that he was able to share in English what they had shared in their native tongue. That's not the only time Joseph III did that. There were other occasions in his ministry, which I won't take time to share, that people were speaking in a language he did not know, and he understood that. That's a rare gift. I can count on the fingers of one hand, actually three people, that I know personally who have heard somebody speak in a language they didn't know, and yet they understood what the person was saying in English. And for at least two of those three people, that was a once in a lifetime experience. It's just not a common thing. But Joseph had that unique gift. He didn't control the gift. It happened when the Spirit chose. Although I give high credibility to Joseph for his spiritual gifts, his awareness of the Holy Spirit, the lens of history comes into play when he is talking about his father. Let me give you an example. When Joseph Smith was on one of his missionary trips to Utah, he visited with the Lott sisters. One of the sisters left the room. He was left with Melissa Lott, and he had a chance to ask some questions he wanted to ask. So he said to Melissa Lott, were you married to my father? Melissa went pulled the Bible off the shelf. She showed him where her father had written in the church that he had married his daughter to Joseph Smith Jr. Joseph started to ask her some questions about that ceremony. He asked her questions about her relationship with her father. He was being careful for the 1800s, but if he was an interviewer today, he would have looked her right in the eye and said, did you have sex with my father? Now that's not the way he put it. But he worded it in terms of, did you live with my father in the way a man and a woman live together? And she said, no, that, that never happened. As he went on and as he probed, she looked at Joseph and she said, you have no right to ask me questions like this. I'm with Melissa Lott on that. I think he was intruding because after all, she was a young woman Joseph Smith was a powerful individual in the church and who knows what kind of pressure she felt to go through the marriage ceremony with, with Joseph Smith Jr. But he kept on and he was interrupted before he could continue to push on. He was like an attorney. Later in his memoirs he said, it was my duty as vigorously as possible to interrogate every woman who claimed to be one of my father's wives. And then later on, Joseph writes in his memoirs, My father only married one woman. Now how do you square that with the fact that Melissa Lott showed him in the Bible and, and told Joseph personally, I was, in, I was married to your father by my dad. And this is how Joseph Smith did that, Joseph III. He said, they were not married if married means living together like a husband and wife. He does the dedication for so his autobiography. He says, dedicated to my father, Joseph Smith Jr., and to Emma Smith, his only wife. You see, Joseph's lens wouldn't let him see what was right in front of his face. It seems to me it should have dawned on him what was my dad doing getting married to Melissa Locke? Why didn't that percolate into his brain? I think it was because he was so determined to validate his father, to clear his father's name, that he could not admit to himself what people were telling him. Now, he doesn't really deny what Melissa Locke told him, but he denies it's a marriage. Well, that's sort of playing around with the definitions. So as much as I love Joseph, as much as I trust his spiritual gifts, there are some matters in which I believe he is blind to things that are right in front of him. And that gives me hope because all of us have blind spots. All of us have something that it's hard for us to hone up to, hard for us to wrap our minds around. And so somehow we sort of push it away and we don't think about it. Let me share a little different story from Joseph Smith's trips to Utah. It was 1885. He met a photographer. He says he thinks he might have posed for the photographer for some portraits, but he's not sure about that. 
but he bought several portraits of Native Americans. And he decided he would take one of them and play a joke on his wife, Bertha, back here in Lamoni, Iowa. So he takes the photo of a woman that he called very attractive, and he mails it to Bertha, and he said, if I should decide to become a Mormon, is this woman acceptable to you as my second wife? I was telling this story in a class in New Mexico, and some woman says, this will not go well. And it did not. Now, Emma wrote back and, or excuse me, Bertha wrote back and said, oh, Shah. But when he got home, and these are Joseph's words, she was a bit plagued by his Indian sweetheart. I think Joseph is putting it mildly. I think Bertha was a little more than a bit plagued. And his joke, I think, backfired. But it shows his humanity. It shows his sense of humor. It shows he tried to do something funny without realizing this is maybe not the kind of joke I should play on my beloved wife. Walking through Rose Hill Cemetery is like walking through early reorganization history. Some of the stories are really happy stories and some of them are just incredibly sad. Unfortunately, I'm going to share two sad stories because it talks about Joseph and how he dealt with grief. Joseph and his family moved from Nauvoo to Plano, Illinois in January 1866. Two months later, his wife Emmeline was homesick and wanted to go back to Nauvoo. So Joseph took Emmeline and their really young son, Joseph Arthur, to the train station in Chicago, Illinois, put them on the train. As he helped them onto the train car, he said he was struck with an impression and he knew he would never see his wife and son alive together again. He said it struck him with a force and a power that uh, it's hard to imagine short of actually watching the event happen. Joseph had ministry to do, places to go, things to do, and so he watched the train pull out of the station. He didn't know which one it would be that would die, but he knew that one of them would die before he saw them again. Would it be Emmeline who had been sick and he had been worried about her health for a while and wondering if her life would be short? Or would it be young Joseph Arthur, who was a quite healthy, almost five-month-old? He guessed it would be Emmeline, Emmeline, but he was wrong. He was off doing ministry when he received an urgent message to come to Nauvoo. He did not make it on time. Young Joseph Arthur died five months from the day he was born. It's a terrible tragedy for Joseph, but it was the first of many tragedies to come his way. He was neither protected from nor made immune to the horrible circumstances of the 1800s in which people regularly lost a spouse or a child. It was just part of life back then. Right here is the headstone of his wife, Bertha, and three of their young children. I'm going to tell you about Bertha Azuba. She was not quite six years old when she was playing in the schoolyard. The teacher called the students to the door and she headed for the door. She did not notice that a boy was playing by swinging a stick around his head, quite long stick, quite rapidly, and he was challenging other kids to run in. She didn't notice that. She ran right into the stick and hit her right in the neck. She was in a lot of pain and allowed to go home. A few days later, she turned terribly ill. The doctor diagnosed a putrid throat. The word was sent to Joseph to get to Nauvoo as quickly as possible. He did not make it in time. He found Zuba shrouded in death. Joseph makes an interesting confession. He didn't think it was possible to love one child above another, but for some reason Zuba had become a favorite of his. He took her death really hard. He grieved terribly. In fact, he confessed to, these are his words, a great spirit of rebellion. Against who? Or against what? He gives us a clue. He said he asked some questions over and over again. Why did this happen? Why did this happen to me? I was out in the mission field doing the Lord's work, trusting everything to providence, and yet this was allowed to happen to me. It got to the point where he could barely function as a minister. The grief, 
the anger, it was all just getting to him. He had hit the point of desperation when he had a spiritual experience. He saw Zuba in a vision, and Zuba was playing with other children, and there was a, an older person there who seemed to be in charge of the children. He looked at Zuba, and she was very happy. The person who was in charge of the children looked at Joseph and said, Joseph, Zuba is very happy here. And he looked at her, and she was. She had a bunch of flowers gathered in her arms, something she loved to do when she was living. That experience changed everything for Joseph. He was able to put behind him that spirit of rebellion. He was able to heal from the grief, put his life back together, and go on with his ministry. He made a theological reflection about all of that when he wrote, I do not believe God sends tragedies to us, but I do believe God allows them to happen and our character is developed as we deal with those tragedies. I need to make a correction to the segment you're going to watch next. I have a tendency to misspeak and I'll say Matthew instead of Luke or Nephite instead of Lamanite. So sometimes my mouth just goes rogue and does its own thing. So when you watch the segment next, when you hear me say Joseph Smith III was a circuit court judge, in your mind you just need to say he was actually a justice of the peace. One of the most significant experiences in Joseph's life, from my point of view, happened in his bedroom in Plano, Illinois. But that's a private house and I can't film there, so I'm upstairs in a bedroom here at Liberty Hall. In 1878 and 1879, a typhoid-like epidemic went through Plano. Joseph and the elders were kept busy almost every day from 6 p.m. till midnight praying for the sick. It was a large congregation. There were only three or four elders. Over a period of time, Joseph Smith became annoyed. He said the, elder, excuse me, the other elders were annoyed too. As this progressed, he became irked. What irked him? The fact that the people that were calling for the elders to lay their hands on their heads and anoint them and pray were also calling for the doctors. And Joseph got so irked at that, he finally one night came to the conclusion that the next time someone asks me to come and pray for them, I'm going to ask if the doctors have been there or if they're going to ask for the doctors. And if they say the doctors, I'm going to say, I'm not coming. For some reason, Joseph never says this explicitly, but it's sort of implied in the whole long story, which you can read at josephthethird.com. In the whole conversation that occurred after his decision, it's sort of implied that he kind of felt like, okay, if you have faith, call for the elders, and, and what happens, happens. And if you don't have faith, don't bug the elders, call for the doctors. So having decided that he would no longer pray for anybody who called for the doctors, he went to bed. Before he fell asleep, he heard steps across his front porch. Someone opened his front door, walked up the stairs, walked into his bedroom, walked over by his bed, took a chair, sat down next to Joseph's bed, took off his hat, and proceeded to interrogate Joseph. Joseph describes the person in great detail, his height, his weight, the clothes he wore, the gray tweed suit, uh, the bowler type hat that he had in his hands. So with his hat on his knee, the stranger begins to ask Joseph questions. And he starts with simple questions about his name and the church he goes to and the apostolic doctrine of prayer for the sick. But as he goes on in the questions, they get more awkward. And Joseph, as a former circuit court judge, decided that something was going on that he did not like. The stranger was asking him questions that took him where he did not want to go. I'm going to give you the Cliff's Note paraphrase version. I'm going to boil down six columns of conversation into just a few sentences. So I read you, urge you to read the whole conversation. Joseph, do you have the power to heal the sick? No, I don't have that power. If I did, everyone I prayed for would be healed. Joseph, when you pray for the sick, who decides if they are healed, you or God? Well, God was the obvious answer. 
As the questions go on, he asks, talks about the doctors coming, and then he says to Joseph, All right, if the doctors care for the sick, and you go and pray for the same people, and ask God to heal them, who decides that they're healed, you or God? Well, God. As the conversation evolves, Joseph gets more irritated. He expresses his irritation to this stranger. The stranger takes his bowler hat off his knee, puts it on his hand, and spins it on his finger, and he looks at Joseph, and he proceeds with the questions. It really boiled down to this. What the stranger was really asking Joseph is, Joseph, what is it to you if the saints are healed? Why do you care if it's the elders or the doctors or both? Joseph finally assented to the direction the stranger was taking him. And he agreed. And the stranger said, I think so too. And the stranger stood up and walked out into the night. Joseph said he didn't know if it was a Nephite or an angel or what, but it changed Joseph's perspective about the fact that medical care from doctors can work together with the prayers of the elders. So in 1906, coincidentally on the day I would be born, Joseph brought a revelation to the church. It is the will of the Lord that a sanitarium be built. Section 127 goes on. It describes what this institution will be for. It will be a place where the skills of the physicians and the prayers of the elders will work together in an atmosphere that is conducive to faith and healing. More remarkably, Apostle Joseph Luff, who had acquired his medical degree, was directed in the revelation to be the head of the institution. And the revelation goes on. It says that Joseph Luff should continue in his spiritual office as an apostle and his calling as a physician. How extraordinary is that? That prayer and faith and medical skill and being an apostle of the Lord Jesus are combined in one person and he is put commanded by God of the sacred institute. As a side note, I was born in that institution. So that place directed by God, through Joseph III, to be built in independence is where my life began. This is a really important issue today, not just in 1906, not just in 1878. Is there a place for faithful prayer and medical skill to work together? Joseph's experience, the Doctrine and Covenants, the history of the sanitarium says, absolutely. There is a place for them to work together. We're upstairs in Liberty Hall. This room was used by Joseph's sons to do all kinds of things. In the room around the corner to my left, Frederick Madison Smith had a dark room. He loved photography as well as science. I've chosen this room to share a message about Joseph Smith III. He had been terribly sick. The saints were worried about him. There was an afternoon prayer and communion service, and during that service, a prophetic message was given, and Albert A. Smith shared this message in the Herald, and you can read it at josephsthethird.com. The anxiety of my people concerning the condition of my servant Joseph is known unto me, saith the Lord. I have heard the prayers that have come up for many homes and I perceive that many hearts have been made very tender and devout. Let not your hearts be troubled in this matter. It is not given to you to know my will as to the time of his departure. Whether he depart or tarry, what is that to thee? But my will shall be done in this as hitherto, for I have directed his life even from the day when the light of this world first dawned upon his eyes. Yea, I am with him now, though that light has failed. Never at any time have I deserted him. 
neither in darkness nor in light, neither in storm nor calm. Because I have loved him, I have withheld neither joy nor sorrow that would be for the perfecting of his character. Because his patience was unfailing and his charity broad and deep, I have loved him and I have not given him my spirit by measure. Because he has loved righteousness and hated iniquity, I have anointed him with the oil of gladness. And his name is numbered with that illustrious company of whom Jesus Christ is head and front. In due time, his now blind and sightless eyes shall behold all the glories of eternity. It remains for the church to profit by his life, to be loving as he was loving, to be charitable as he was charitable, and to go on in faith. They are admonished also to look beyond him to the man of Galilee, whose great sacrifice has been celebrated here today, and whose example they should imitate in all things. Amen. Thank you, Jim, for sharing these stories of Joseph Smith III, your friend, who lived here at Liberty Hall. It's time to bring this first annual Joseph Smith III Peace Lecture to a close. And I'd like to thank Jim uh, for sharing these memories of his friend Joseph. I'd also like to thank Barbara and Wendy Eaton of the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation and Glenn Johnson of the Lodi Heartland Mission Center. Lastly, I'd like to thank each of you, our friends in the audience, for your love of a good story and for generously supporting Liberty Hall and the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation with your donations that makes events like this possible. Thank you and have a good rest of the day.